Thank you very much. Good evening. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics at the University of Kansas. I'm Bill Lacey, director of the Institute. Tonight we feature the second of four parts of our presidential lecture series, the 2008 campaign. The Dole Institute is lucky to have many friends on campus who help us with our programming on a regular basis. Tonight's event, Blog to the Chief, will be, more, will be moderated by Professor David Perlmutter, who helped us organize it. David is Associate Dean for Graduate Studies and Research at the William Allen White School of Journalism and Mass Communications here at the university. He's the author or editor of seven published or forthcoming books on political communication and persuasion, including the most recent, I believe this is the most recent, right? Blog Wars, the New American Political Battleground from Oxford University Press. David will moderate our discussion. Please welcome David Perlmutter. Thank you. I've been asked to announce, as I often do before classes, please turn off your cell phones, video games, anything that may distract us or you. Uh, thank you very much, Bill. I also want to thank Steve Jakes, who is the associate director of the Dole Institute and both the youngest and most experienced advanced man in politics, and especially Lawrence Bush. Lawrence Bush is the director of facilities and events at Dole, and he and I shared a passion and interest in blogging that eventually led to this panel. I think it's very appropriate that we are in the Dole Institute of Politics to talk about political blogging. I was honored a few weeks ago to be in Washington, D.C. and attend a salute to Senator Dole where he spoke and was usual, as usual, witty and wise. And he mentioned something that I think we can recall tonight, and that is that we face many problems in the United States and in the world, and they, those problems will not be solved by just one man or one party or one program or one ideology. At the end of the day, we may disagree, but we're going to have to cooperate on some level. That cooperation, as well as the disagreement, is called politics. It's also called democracy, and it's what the Dole Institute of Politics is all about under the directorship of Bill Lacey. Now, in terms of democracy and politics, there's no topic that has received as much interest within the last two to three years, and especially within the last two to three months, than the role of political blogs in electing candidates and more specifically our discussion tonight in electing the next president of the United States of America. We have a very distinguished panel and if you can imagine it's very difficult to find people to be an expert in something as recently evolved as blogs and as rapidly evolving. And before I introduce you to I would like to point out that if you just look at them right now you can see that they belie some of the stereotypes that you might have of bloggers. None of them are wearing pajamas. <laughs> uh, none of them have tinfoil hats on, and you probably would let them near your children if they were walking towards you in, in the supermarket. <laughs> we begin on my left, and uh, I didn't put you there by any uh, coincidence, uh, but uh, everybody here in the panel, left and right, is on my left, Jerome Armstrong. Jerome Armstrong is one of the founding fathers of political blogging, an architect of Howard Dean's internet campaign, and has worked as a strategic advisor for multiple campaigns and organizations. He is the co-author of Crashing the Gate, Net Roots, Grassroots, and the Rise of People-Powered Politics. To his left, again, sorry, Eric, that I put you to the left, but Eric Woods Erickson is the managing editor and one of the founders of redstate.com, the largest conservative community blog on the internet. In 2004, Eric blogged the presidential election for MSNBC, going on to cover the president's inauguration, the funeral for Pope John Paul II, the election of Pope Benedict, and subsequent to his time at MSNBC, he's appeared on numerous other networks and written for other newspapers. Patrick Hines, to his left in the center, not the ideological center again, but the center of our panel, is the president of New Media Strategics. He serves as a blog consultant for Senator John McCain's Straight Talk America PAC. <clears throat> he is the founder and proprietor of the blog Ankle Biting Pundits. He is the author of the book In the Defense of the Religious Right and also has been published in many major newspapers. And to his left, Scott W. Johnson is a Minneapolis attorney, a fellow of the Claremont Institute for the Study of Statesmanship and Public Policy, and co-founder of the 
Powerline blog, Time Magazine's first and so far only blog of the year in 2004. In addition to publishing articles on trial and appellate practice, he's contributed to many essays and columns to journals and, and newspapers like the National Review and the Weekly Standard. And then finally we have Joan McCarter. Joan McCarter is a fellow at Daily Costs, writing full-time for the world's most popular political blog as McJoan. She was one of a dozen bloggers who attended a private meeting with President Bill Clinton in September, and she's currently researching a book on Western politics. She has a master's degree in international studies from the University of Washington and worked there as a writer and editor and instructional designer from 1995 to 2006. Tonight, we're going to get a chance to listen to our panelists, but then about 50 minutes in the program, as Bill Lacey mentioned, we will be opening up uh, to questions. This also is being broadcast at our KU Edwards campus, and they will get to ask a, a question for us. I wanted to just say uh, a few notes of introduction in that I've been teaching classes in mass communication for about 10 years now, and one of the problems when you teach in our field is you actually have to update your lectures. And so I have to force myself to, the other day I had to, about a couple months ago, I had to force myself to try to find out what Facebook was and why my students were spending more time looking at Facebook than they were doing their homework for, for my class. Obviously, the world has changed quite a bit. When I was young, the remote control of a television was the youngest member of a family. We only had three or four choices of what we could watch on television, a few print choices. We've changed quite a great, great deal. And what's clear is that blogs, not necessarily as the only medium, but are part of a whole new wave of interactive, instant, always on new media technologies. They're changing every aspect of our culture and our society and even politics. To give you a couple of examples, the New York Times, the Ford Motor Company, Barbara Streisand, and the deposed king of Cambodia all blog. And they do so because they're trying to reach an audience perhaps in a different way than they would have through normal venues. Just in terms of what we're talking about tonight, running for president, we have John Edwards. John Edwards probably could be considered the most aggressive blogging candidate of the last two or three years, even though unannounced. He regularly holds private meetings with bloggers wherever he travels and has a, a very active blog and guest blogging agenda. Mitt Romney features a Mitt Head blog role on his website that boasts more than 6,700 pro-Mitt blogs. Hillary Clinton has hired a blogger-in-chief for her campaign for the presidency, and her husband, the former president, as I mentioned, met with a number of bloggers, including our own Joan McCarter here. Now, Barack Obama, who I think you could possibly classify as the most tech-savvy uh, current candidate for president, always has been guest blogging, has been podcasting, and I noted the other day that uh, his supporters have, have made a vow that they're going to make him the first person to have one million friends on his <laughs> Facebook page. I'd like to have you know, two or three, but I think that's, pretty, that's uh, pretty good. Now, one of the points that I've always made to my students is that a lot of the new technology in some ways is tapping into very old wants and needs as us as people. I say successful mass communication, going back to Julius Caesar, is pretty much predicated on the same thing as successful mass communication today. And that is successful mass communication is that which best approximates successful personal communication. If you're watching a, a president or a political candidate give a speech on television and you feel like he or she is talking to you personally, then probably that's had the greatest effect on you. So we don't know how all of these technologies are going to uh, affect us. But we do know that blogs and the new interactive media such as Facebook or MySpace or, or, or certainly YouTube are of great interest to political candidates. All my former students who majored in political communication are now working somewhere for some campaign or some political consultant as a blogging consultant, which is one of the most wonderful things in the world is to be 22 years old and people assume you must be an expert in, in something and blogging falls under that category. What's clear to us, though, is that 
a lot of what is true about blogs and political campaigns is not necessarily absolutely clear. You have in front of you people who qualify as experts, but we all probably would agree that we don't really know how everything is going to turn out. We do know the following, that discussion and dialogue is probably the beginning of understanding the very complex and diverse world of blogs, or in the words of the leading Democratic <coughs> contender for the presidency, let's talk. I want to begin with maybe asking you a question, Joan McCarter at, uh, of Daily Cost. We've been through an election cycle now, 2004, 2006. If you were advising any particular presidential candidate or all of them about what lessons we've learned about the relationship of blogging and running for president, what would they be? I think probably the most important lesson for a presidential candidate to have learned in the past two cycles, but particularly in 2006, is that this isn't a static medium that they talk at. They'll be most successful when they actually engage in the blogging, when they come into a blog, when they respond with comments, when they post regularly, when they're not using it just as another place to put their press releases. And probably the second most important thing, let's, let's make it the first most important thing, we're not an ATM. Too many candidates have, particularly after Howard Dean's success, looked at the blogs as a place to raise a lot of money fast. We're more than that now, and we'll demand more than that now. Scott, uh, you have a lot of experience in uh, money. You're working for, for a bank. What Joan was saying about uh, blogging being an, an ATM, are they lessons there for running for president? You know, I, I feel like I inhabit a different uh, part of the Internet universe than Joan, uh, li listening to what she just said. Um, it sounds like you're talking a, as part of a movement and, and that um, the politicians on your side of the world have figured out some way to use the, uh, the internet uh, and that movement to, to contribute to their ambitions. Uh, you know, I, I work full time practicing law and I got into writing about politics with my law partner John Hinderocker in 1992 on the side of our law practice for fun. Um, it, it was a way of using our, our research and writing skills to write about things we were interested in and thought we could make a contribution. And we just started uh, writing op-ed columns and magazine pieces uh, for about 10 years before John was, I think, inspired by what he saw Andrew Sullivan was doing to start a blog over Memorial Day weekend in 2002. And we just started, conti continued to do what we had been doing in newspapers and magazines on our site, which was con commenting uh, about politics and, and offering our analysis, which was uh, you know, something like opinion journalism, but we hoped always based on facts. The internet really added something to what we were doing in that field by uh, letting us invite readers to look over our shoulders, to check our facts, to check our sources, gave us the opportunity uh, to link to the sources of information that we were uh, relying on. And uh, so I would say that we have continued over the past five years that we've been writing for Powerline to offer our point of view, uh, which is independent of any particular politician. Uh, we're, the three of us who write for it are all practicing attorneys, conservatives, and, uh, and, and Republicans, um, but we're independent of any particular uh, uh, politician or movement, and although we've supported individuals as, as things get into campaign mode, um, I feel like our relationship to campaigns and politicians is a little bit different than what Joan was just describing. Well, we have several bloggers who are, have or are actually working for uh, political campaigns for President Pat Hines. Uh, would you take us into a meeting with John McCain and you giving him advice on how he should use blogging to run for president? Well, the first thing I would do is say don't use blogs. <laughs> don't try to use blogs. Um, try to work with blogs. I think. If I could take what Joan and what Scott just said, I would say that on the left side of the blogosphere, there is more of a community mindset. And I think when what Scott said about the conservative side is, is also uh, accurate, that there are a lot of more independent voices that don't necessarily work as part of a community, but are nevertheless very smart and, and generate a lot of traffic and, and contribute a lot to the dialogue. So I would tell any presidential candidate or any candidate for any office, 
don't go in there and try to use blogs because that's going to hurt you. These people are too smart, uh, they're too uh, engaged, and they don't want to be used. Instead, try to have a dialogue with them. I mean, I don't want to sound too much like Senator Clinton, no disrespect, but we do want to have that conversation with them. And if at any time a blogger says, look, we don't want to have this conversation with you anymore, any politician should stop. Jerome Armstrong, you probably have more experience than anyone here starting out with the most famous early uh, blog-related political campaign working for Howard Dean. Could you, could you give us a little bit of history on maybe how your perspectives have changed in answering the question of the relationship of blogs and running for president? Sure. Well, the last cycle, 2003, which is about the same time as right now, 2007 for 2003, there were it, the, the, the size, the readership of the blogs has increased a hundredfold. It was a much smaller universe back then. But the dynamics were still at play in that Howard Dean had to interact with, with the bloggers in the blogosphere. And what I, what I tried to do, and I do this with most politicians, and I was very successful with Mark Warner, is by getting them to understand it by interacting with the bloggers. You can look at the bloggers in, in the same way that you do many of the traditional political operations of these are people that, that have communities of, that are political political powerful that you need to engage with. And by beginning that dialogue with the, with the candidate, with the blogger, they, they come to, rather than me sitting in the room and trying to explain it to the candidate, letting them actually talk to the bloggers, different perspectives from many different sides of the, uh, um, the spectrum, they begin to understand it. So when they do go into those communities or they interact with people, they have a better understanding. Would, would you, would your advice have changed? Today, I know if you want to talk maybe a little about you, you did some work with, with Mark Warner, who was considering running for president. It's changed in the sense that it's, it's much bigger. And I think the difference now is that, look, last time Howard Dean was the only one. He basically had the playing field to himself. Wesley Clark had a, a grassroots movement that developed later on in the cycle. But how it's changed this time is that it's the exact opposite. Whoever doesn't have a very active outreach into the blogosphere, into the, onto the internet, is the anomaly. And so it's a much more competitive landscape. So it's even more important to be out there early in, in terms of the presidential cycle. And I've seen what, I think what we've seen happen here on both sides is that uh, one of the candidates, for example, Romney, started getting attacked on the, on the blogs and, and he realized that this is the angle he needed to go into very quickly. Hillary Clinton realized that she didn't have anybody that was representing her out in the blogosphere and she went out and hired some people. So that's the dynamic at play now. You see it much more of a competitive advantage that Howard Dean was able to grasp and, and it was untested and untried so people were sort of skeptical about it but now the political establishment very much views it as something that's very valuable and it's much more competitive this cycle. Eric Erickson, you run a, a community blog as you, as you self-define it and I want to pick up on the term that, that several of you have used, Joan and, and uh, Jerome, about using. And do you get a sense sometimes about whether a politician is coming to you or coming to your community or community that you're part of and they want to use you for their own purposes but they're not understanding what your, your community is about? How uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think it happens frequently. Um, politicians communications directors for politicians don't quite yet understand the medium. Um, but my, my advice to them would to some degree be twofold, that blogs are more likely to harm you than help you, but that they're also a necessary tool. Um, they can really help you refine and define your message, get it out there. I think it was the, the Pew study from a year ago surveying people who read blogs found that only 11% of the nation really reads blogs, but those people are more likely than not the opinion leaders in their community. And politicians need to understand that, that they are reaching out to people who can help form opinions in local communities. They, they can't come and just send a press release. A, a press release may work for the media, but bloggers aren't the media. They're, there's, it's a unique communications tool. It, it is communication. It's a conversation. And without understanding that, uh, they're not going to get anywhere. It's, it's much different from posting a press release on their personal website. Joe McCarty, talk about conversation. How would I start a conversation with a group of bloggers? And let's, let's start out with your narrative on how did Bill, you end up having Bill Clinton call you and say he wanted to have lunch with you? 
Actually, it was his wife, blogger, Peter Zhao, who I'm, I'm not sure how they identified the bloggers that they wanted to talk to. Um, they got a fairly good sampling of us. Um, Peter Dow called and said the president would like to talk with you, and when the president would like to talk with you, even if it's the former president, you comply. <laughs> it, it was a great time. It was a great lunch. It was about two and a half hours. We were scheduled for, I believe, 45 minutes, so in true Bill Clinton fashion. We were there for two and a half hours. Um, probably more listening than talking, but he really being the voracious reader that he is, reads all of the blogs, all of them. Um, we're in his press clips every day. Actually, Chelsea was the one who got him started reading blogs. Uh, he's fascinated by the medium, fascinated by the quick response that we can have. One of the things that brought the group there was um, in the wake of the path to 9-11, the ABC docudrama uh, miniseries that had quite a few factual errors about the Clinton presidency leading up to some of the actions that were taken by the Clinton administration in the lead up to September 11th. Um, we got an early copy, one of the bloggers on the left side got a, an early copy of this DVD, started going through it carefully, started finding where some of the errors were, blogging about it, and it became rather a cause on the left side of the blogosphere, and we did end up forcing some edits on in the miniseries before it aired and raising the issue that, that this was a biased account of the events. Um, Clinton was really very appreciative of that, very curious as to how we could make that happen so fast, how we could respond so quickly and bring it into the public sphere so quickly. And he wanted to, to thank us for that and, and to explore a little bit more about how it all works. What specific advice did did you give him or other people in the room give him about wh why that speed is possible in the world, the internet world that probably he wasn't, he wasn't as familiar with, with the, the news cycle of, of crafting a speech on a national issue in response to a news story a few days before and so on? Um, the primary response is that we're our own editors. We know that we have a very critical audience that will catch us right away if we make a mistake, so we can respond very quickly, very carefully, and we can, what we call blog swarm an issue. Um, communicate via email with other bloggers, say, hey, I've looked at this, I think this is an issue, you've got some experience in this, would you take a look? Um, and, and sort of communicate virally among the blogs that are allied. There's an there's a important... Um other factor that's too that plays out, especially on Daily Coast and some of the larger blogs, is that you have comments on all the things that are taking place in the post. So it's it's much more of a, it's a factor of you know how many people are participating participating in the blog in terms of being able to go out and gather information and, and able to do things like rapid response. So you look at what uh, Bill Clinton had with the War Room in 1992, which was a, a, a really innovative thing for campaigning because it had all these people that were doing rapid response and getting all the clips from all over the place. Well, a blog is many more times that you have thousands of people being able to do that sort of research over the internet and then it filter up if the campaigns are reading it right to them. But Bill Clinton was the master of rapid response. I, there's, there's the documentary, The War Room, mm -hmm. that, that depicts that operation that they had going in 1992. I don't think he could have survived uh, without it. I think he could have taught all of us a, a thing or two, Joan, about, about rapid response, uh, e even in the pre-internet world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and it's not surprising then that that's what he was most intrigued with by, by our blogging response. I wanted to ask the panelists if you had to do a uh, um, American Idol critique of the current blogging presidential candidates on who would you give the, the highest marks to in their interplay with, with blogging, understanding of, of blogging? I would probably give it to John Edwards at this point on the, uh, on the Democratic side because I think he, is, he has been the one out of all of them that has learned the lessons from 2004 the most and he, he, he you know, it, we tend to treat our losers on the Democratic side with, with a lot of disdain, but failure is a great 
learning mechanism. And he did not, he, even though he had opportunities in the last cycle to do uh, engage the blogosphere, start meetup, that sort of thing, which all Howard Dean did, he learned from those mistakes and very early on um, rectified those and began re outreaching to bloggers. And, and he's probably unparalleled in that regard. But he's just, he's just the first guy who's gone through a convulsion in his campaign with respect to yes. bloggers. How do you account for that? I think that was a, well, you know, that getting a little bit too much in the campaign, but there was a, a case there where he has invited so many people into his internet war room, so to speak, that you had a lot of cooks in the kitchen and somehow they didn't vet that person properly. And this person had a, um, you know, postings that flared up in the campaign and the campaign had to try to maneuver around and, 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 and defend um, so you know, in some se in some sense, it was you know a miscalculation on their part. I heard Joan talking in an interview for this uh, event about the fact that Mrs. Edwards was among the most sophisticated and voracious readers of blogs. That made me think that she probably knew who was being signed on and knew what they were getting. Possibly, you know? possibly. I, I don't know about her involvement. I would not be I surprised. Either. I mean, I've heard different accounts. I'm not yeah. sure. And, and you know the person that I got the email from that she was hired, it wasn't it wasn't from her. It was somebody else that was coordinating with it. But yeah, I mean that's part of it. The, I, I think I look at that as like a, a, you know, it had not happened before. No one else had been called out that had been working on a campaign for their blogging past. I don't know. I can't recall anybody else that's happened to. And so maybe they just didn't think of it as on the horizon, a possibility. But I imagine that a lot of candidates on both sides of the aisle are now going through the archives yeah, of their so. bloggers. <laughs> sure, and I, yeah. you know, when I hired people yeah. for campaigns, I would vet them by yeah. looking at that. Mm -hmm. Well, you probably have a situation there is that somebody who is not necessarily a blogger just did not think of it. Mm -hmm. Well, Eric uh, Erickson, would you make the same assessment of some of the Republicans running? Who's doing the best job of blogging? in running for president now? I think I'm supposed to say John McCain. Absolutely. <laughs> That's the answer. Uh, I, you know, it, it's taking different <laughs> forms. Um, Romney's doing a very good job of, of reaching out, uh, as is McCain, and then some of the others are, are coming on slowly. Giuliani just seems to be getting his campaign off the ground. Um, Hunter is nowhere to be seen. Brownback is slowly off the ground. R right now, I think probably Julia, or uh, rather, uh, Romney and, and McCain, and, and I, I would have to agree on the Democratic side, probably Edwards, although I, I'm fascinated by the um, Barack Obama website that launched. There were some bugs in it that launched on Sunday, uh, but it actually is rather impressive what he's trying to do through his website operation. Pat Hines, again, please take us into the McCain <laughs> war room. Uh, you're you're, you're the front runner right now, if we could describe possibly anybody being the front runner on the, the Republican side. I had a political consultant once tell me that the reason that he just didn't know how to use blogs or may ha create a blog or, or have a blog in the campaign was that he felt they were ticking time bombs, mm -hmm. asking somebody to just make up stuff off the top of their head and be <laughs> spontaneous with some political candidates. It's like handing them a, 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 a suicide knife, you know, and right. to say so. How do you balance in a campaign the, the traditional importance of message discipline and control with what blogs are all about, which is some, some level of stream of consciousness and this is what I'm thinking right now? Well, the first thing that you, that you do is decide that you're not going to start by starting a blog. That would be a mistake because the, the likelihood of you being able to populate it with interesting content frequently uh, enough is very small. It's, it's not likely at all that you'd be able to do that. Instead, in, in our particular case, Senator McCain has a, a strained relationship with quite a few people on, on the right side of the blogosphere, including my friend Eric. <laughs> and, and so it, you know, it, would be, it would be a mistake for us to just launch a blog and say, we're now part of the community. Uh, instead, we're working to try to build relationships that, that didn't exist before and that need to be built now before we start saying, hey, we're one of you now. When it comes to balancing uh, the stream of consciousness with the message discipline, I, I, the only thing I can say is that it is, it is an art form, not a science. <laughs> or, there's a, probably no way you can teach it. 
and there's going to be a million mistakes before it's perfected. Um, I think we saw Senator Edwards uh, make a mistake uh, this past week. I don't know that it necessarily was uh, a fair treatment of his campaign, um, but you're going to see more and more of those things as, uh, as campaigns enter this spontaneous conversation. Well, I guess I have a technical question for, for any of you who want to answer. Uh, it's no great shock and surprise when we found out a politician has given a great speech and it's been written by somebody else. And we don't think that that's plagiarism and that you stole the words. Uh, with a blog post, though, I guess I would be a little disappointed to find out the intimate, you know, spontaneous, thoughtful, uh, close to the heart blog post was written by a, a, a great team of campaign staffers. Would that take away from claiming that you're blogging at all? You know, I'm actually surprised by the number of people who react that way. We, we run into that at Red State frequently. We have um, members of Congress, uh, some of whom actually do write their own posts, but the majority of whom it's a staffer writing for them. And, and the reaction of, of many people to that is one of, uh, I would say, mild displeasure that it's not the actual uh, member of Congress or, or presidential candidate, for that matter, writing their post. What stands out and, and what differentiates the, the amateurs, I guess, from, from the people doing a really good job are when they're actually willing to go into the comments and respond. Um, for example, Tom DeLay has started uh, writing at Red State. Uh, he wrote his first post at Red State. Uh, and Tom DeLay actually is one of those who he actually stands over someone in, in stream of consciousness as they bang it out on the keyboard for him. Uh, so in a way, I guess you could say he is writing it. Uh, people were actually amazed when when individuals were coming onto the site and, and slamming him for the 2006 outcome for, for scandal and corruption in Abramoff, uh, he actually showed up in the comments responding point by point. What one person actually had put in a comment uh, saying, I, I will make a public apology, but he's never going to come on and address these issues. Well, not only did he, but at the bottom of the second post where he addressed the comments, he said, Cassie, I'll accept that public apology now. So, <laughs> really engaging. That's good. Yeah, I, I have on with with the candidates that I've worked with. Um, you know, maybe it's because I, I view blogging as you know I've done it a lot. I have asked them to blog. I'll go through and edit their stuff, you know, and correct all the spelling errors and everything. But um, and it's actually you know a lot of them are single finger keyboarders. I think that the more innovative way for politicians to interact with 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 blogging and still be in the same spirit of um, engaging on a more person to person level is with with informal video, with video that's just, you know, if, if a candidate could get used to being videotaped all the time, no matter what they're doing, and, and you know, as long as it's not like key strategic information, start to release that on a, on a daily basis to the public. I think the blogosphere and the people that are engaging with politics online would find that very compelling because then you're going to start to get a human interaction. It's not a canned speech that they've got prepared for and they're going to go in front of the camera and deliver three or four times like, all of the videos that we've seen the candidates release for their announcement speeches. If we actually get a candidate out there this cycle that lets the camera follow them around and has an editing team within their campaign to release that on a daily basis, that's going to get a lot of attention. I think one of the at, the, at the kernel of your question is the fact that political communication is changing dramatically and that candidates have to understand that they're not necessarily going to be in control of their message the way they have been in the past. When I first started working in campaign politics 15 years ago, there was this rule that you never repeat the charge. That if somebody attacks you, you, you either attack back or you uh, avoid the question, but you never repeat the charge because then you're going to then you're going to look like it's really affecting you. Then it sounds like it's coming from your lips. Well, we live in a day a day and age where just because you're not repeating the charge doesn't mean that everybody isn't already hearing it. I mean, there are millions of ways to communicate to people through the internet, through television, radio, all the rest of it. And so you need to engage. You can't pretend that your opponents aren't saying this about you. I think that's what, I think everybody, Republican, Democrat, or Independent, will tell you was Senator Kerry's problem in 2004, is that he pretended that he lived in this world where no one was criticizing him. And there was this huge problem that he had to deal with that went f back to when he was 22 years old or whatever during, during, uh, uh, after he returned from Vietnam. Um, so 
I think what, what Jerome is saying, and I, I agree, is that there has to be a level of candor that needs to be brought into the process so that politicians take a step back from the message and acknowledge that there is a conversation and it's not just one way. And, and that is part of what you were talking about earlier about the level of sophistication of the blogging audience. Reading some of our comments, you wouldn't think that necessarily it's a sophisticated <laughs> group of people, but most of them are pretty politically savvy and pretty demanding of their politicians. And when a politician does show up in comments and takes a little bit of heat and answers back, it makes a tremendous difference for the blockers in levels of respect for that candidate. I wanted to ask about comments. Um, a while back, I was looking at uh, Wesley Clark's Westpac website, and he held a town hall blog meeting where he was answering lo live on, on online questions. And of course, uh, somebody asked him about Roswell and the saucer crash there. Uh, I am assuming those questions were not filtered before they, they, the general's answer, as I recall, by the way, that he'd never been briefed on Roswell, so that he, he didn't know. <laughs> uh, have any of you been briefed? I just went. Okay. Uh, what What do you say to a traditional political consultant who's going? You know, I'm just not going to open up my candidate to to lunatics asking them crazy questions and, and putting them on the spot. Well, the first thing I would tell them is it's where the people are and there's more people than ever that are there. The axiom of all political candidates is to go to where the people are. If you're not and your opponent is, they have a competitive advantage over you. I would say you're gonna lose. I would say if you're not gonna answer questions from people uh, online, then you might as well not go to a town hall meeting in New Hampshire or Iowa. Um, because if you're not willing to answer questions from people, you, you don't, you're not fit for high public office. I mentioned, and several of you have done, about Hillary's let's talk statement. And it's clear to me in st that stylistically blogging or interactive media technologies have affected the way that politicians talk. Do you think in some way that speeches or debate points are going to be different because of blogs? Are, are politicians going to speak to us differently than they have done in the past? Well, I sure don't think so. I, I, I uh, think that the, there's a tremendous uh, tradition of uh, powerful political rhetoric. I wish the politicians would get more in touch with rather than uh, the kind of uh, dumbing down and s synthetic, uh, the kind of synthetic stuff you see in, in advertisements and, and even in Mrs. Clinton's uh, uh, original presentation, although I think she's, she's going to be a tremendous uh, candidate. Uh, that, that announcement was just so... Uh, Phony, I thought it was uh, condescending, um, and, and it seems to me that there is a, a great place, I think, in, in the Republican Party, Rudy Giuliani uh, uh, seems to me somebody who's able to get in touch, uh, to marshal the language in a way that's very powerful and that, and that brings people into alignment with him who, who, who aren't necessarily on board with all his, uh, his issues or, or uh, the stances he's taken in the course of his career. So. The political gift, the ability to communicate with people, I think, uh, remains the, the core of a, a strong candidate. And I think that the, those of us kibitzing on the side uh, are, aren't going to affect that much. Not this cycle, not 2008, but I think that there could be an evolution as they get more used to the kind of conversation that we have on blogs, as they get more used to the kind of conversation they have in town halls. And as, frankly, some of the consulting class currently making all of their money off of all of these politicians um, is replaced by new people, that you might see new forms of advertising, new consulting on how to do a debate, how to be effective in messaging. I think we might see an evolution there. We might see a change. You know, I, I actually think it'll improve the conversation. Uh, to build on what Joan was saying earlier about interacting, it, it's a, a politician never wants to shoot himself in the foot by anything he says online or offline. It's going to be easily traced to them, but they can't avoid the conversation anymore. In the past, they've been able to avoid the conversation. Uh, they, they can't do that anymore with blogs. And so they're either going to descend or, or they're going to go up. It, it's not going to stay static. 
and if, if they descend into, into the, the crass mass of, of what some people think the blogosphere is, then it's not going to help them with the average public that doesn't actually read blogs. But if they actually get involved, get engaged in the debate, and, and have the conversation on the left and, and, and on the right, it's only going to improve them, I think. It'll improve their ideas. It'll improve their message. Um, it, 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 it's stereotypical. It's, it's cliche, but I think it's the truth that there's a great big difference between what goes on inside the Beltway in Washington am, among consultants and what actually goes on out here. The, the ideas and values there necessarily aren't out here, uh, particularly the ideas. And, and reaching out into the blogosphere, you're reaching out very easily, very cost effectively to the people who are not inside the Beltway but are out here. You know, a great example that in the blogs, but the, the middleman is gone. You know, the filter, the, the mainstream media filter comes down. And the issue that is huge for so many of us who have enjoyed the freedom and spontaneity of the internet is, is this campaign finance regulation, which just attacks at the core of our First Amendment rights, which do belong to us as citizens and not to the people who own the presses. Um, Again. And so, you know, I, it's an issue. It, whereas, whereas, you know, in the pre-blog era, if it were <coughs> if it were David Broder and his friends at the Washington Post who were uh, conducting the dialogue and, and dictating the terms of the debate, I'm not sure that would even be raised as a serious issue, but it will be. Well, you know, I think it's very interesting you say that. If you read uh, a lot of columnists on the left and the right, I, I think it's the media and, and the the columnist and the set pundits out there who have a bigger problem with us than the politicians do, from David Broder <laughs> to George Will. Right. Well, you, you can't go a, a month or two. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but legitimately, we, we, yes. we have reason to. They, they have been for years in, in the newspapers of this country setting the tone, setting right. the agenda. Um, they've all been out there for their Walter Cronkite moment at, at some point in their lives. A lot of them never get it, but they've been trying. And here come these guys they view as amateurs who who are now setting the stage and changing the conversation to a degree that they've never been able well, to. Well, and that's and that's the that's the the meat of it. That all of my friends on all across the political spectrum, wh whether they're deeply involved in politics and campaigns or not, they all have the same fundamental complaint. It's the media. They say the media decides the front runners. The media decides what issues we're going to talk about. The media decides what non-scandals we're going to play up and what, what scandals we're going to play down. And that is a unifying sentiment in the blogosphere on, on both the left and the right, is this idea that these old brokers of information are not honest people who necessarily have what's best for our country and for our process in mind. And we're going to take steps to as Scott said, cut out the middleman. And we're going to be the actors in this process because we're regular people. Well, you know, the, the perfect example of that, I think right now, looking at the media is, um, it, David said a little while ago, McCain being the front runner. If you look at the majority of the polls nationwide, uh, most of the polls show Giuliani uh, ahead of McCain to some degree, but the media has shaped up this uh, Romney-McCain battle on the right. They've to some degree shaped up an Obama-Clinton battle on the left, and I personally don't see that across the board, well, that's, that's it's right. the media. I mean, it, the media has created these, these kinds of two-person two races on either side, and, and I've said to people, and I've written in my town hall column, Rudy Giuliani is consistently ahead of Senator John McCain in poll after poll after poll. That may mean he's frankly more popular. It may mean he's just on an ebb or, or, or you know, who knows what it means, but stop saying that he's not the front runner. Isn't he? The, isn't he also um, high ranking in, on the on the poll online polls amongst Republicans? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at you know in the last cycle, uh, I did some polling on this would have been like early 2003, late 2002 with Howard Dean and on on MightyD.com, the blog I was blogging on, and and Howard Dean would rank above any of the other candidates, but nationally he was only polling, you know, at one percent, two percent, and. It is true that the people that are on the internet do vote. They are very engaged in the political process. It'll be interesting to see if, if uh, Giuliani has more support because of that. I wanted to ask about the, the horse race aspect because in terms of media criticism, the most consistent criticism of mainstream journalism's coverage of political campaigns really since the 1970s has been that there's way too much coverage, 
space devoted to horse race. You know, who's ahead by one point in a, a poll you know, two years before the election? <laughs> who's $20 ahead in fundraising? Who won a non-binding straw poll in Pocatello? M no, my apologies, Idaho, uh, Joan <laughs> McCarter. Uh, that, that, that's, that takes up, and actually when we, we communication researchers have done studies, we find that that takes up just a substanti substantial amount of space and there's almost like a, there's no air left, no print space left for, for those issues. Uh, do you think that political blogging is going to help us refocus on issues or it, are the same temptations of a five point poll and this, this fundraising still there? Well, I think it's still there, but you have infinitely more space to also cover the other issues. The, the polling, polling are the easiest stories. Uh, the journalist doesn't have to do much research into the issues or the, or the strategy. They can just look at the poll and report the poll and make it into a horse race story and be very engaging, much like the, the crime leads the news, the poll always reads the, the political coverage. But at the same time, there's a lot more information out there. I'm actually finding more and more journalists are beginning to, to seek bloggers out and, and get blogger insight into some of these strategy and issue stories that they probably wouldn't have in the past, part of it being a trend, but part of it I also think that they're kind of picking up on this, that blogs are really outshining the media on the in-depth coverage of political campaigns and issues to some degree, to, to a degree they haven't seen before. It's up to the candidates also to realize that they have that space out there. They have that 24-7 space out there to go out and interact with people regardless of what the polls are saying because you're right, the, the horse the, it has become too much about the horse race with the national campaign coverage, but the blogs exist out there as a medium which engages in politics all the time, and the candidates, if they realize that that's out there, can push forward on their issues much more. Political junkies, though, love the polls. So on, on every political website, you're going to see lots of talk about polls. But one of the things that we can do, because we have so many geeks who love polls, is they're <laughs> She says that term lovingly. <laughs> yeah. lovingly. They're very, very good at dissecting those polls. So I think you can learn a lot more, actually, from a good blog post about a poll and the comments following it than you can from the newspaper story. One final question before we turn to the audience for their questions. Um, I, it would be impossible to talk about blogging without going through the, the most, uh, well, angry denunciation of blogging that you will find in certain famous columnists that were mentioned uh, recently, but um, I'm trying to make friends with them so I won't mention them <laughs> by, by name. Uh, bloggers have been accused of every possible crime against democracy, uh, that you are lowering the standards of political discourse, that you are dividing the nation. Do you feel that there's any changes or trends within blogging that will affect how people view you? I mean, is, is, it, is it a gen Joan, you are making a very interesting theory, the generational theory of change, which is, you know, when the old people die, then you've got the new people who believe something new. Are, 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 are attitudes towards blogging going to change when the older generation of political columnists that, that retires? Blogging is changing. There are now professional bloggers. I'm one of them. I'm paid for blogging every day. That's the, the most important change I see coming in blogging is that it becomes professionalized, that we can devote full time to it, that we can do the kind of primary research, primary reporting, that needs to be done. Um, and in that can become the new generation of, if you will, punditry. Thank you. Um, we now will open up to questions. If you would raise your hand, one of our students is going to come towards you with a microphone. We have a, a lady in the front here and, and someone in the back. We'll go second. Yes, ma'am, please. Um, one of the things that you did not talk about uh, was the way that the blogosphere uh, amplifies YouTube. And I guess you could call YouTube a visual blogosphere, but it had a fairly dramatic impact on George Allen, for example. Um, can you talk about how that relationship works and whether you see the people who post on um, YouTube as kind of visual bloggers? Very much so. It's, it's the fascinating thing about blogging is that it's always changing. I did a media reform conference last month, and we had somebody there who organized something called Video the Vote, where people would go out to their precincts with their cell phones or their video cameras 
and if they saw issues of voter suppression or voter fraud, things that concern them, they could film it right there, come back, put it up on the web, and immediately advertise the problem. Um, I felt kind of like a dinosaur because I write words that go onto a page that people read. Um, my, my space, Facebook, all of these social networking tools, including video, are becoming sort of the new big thing, and, and smart blogs are going to figure out how to envelop them, how to use them. Well, and, the, and the, the dynamic behind that is, if you read you know, Chris Anderson's The Long Tail, we find out that we make all, all of our judgments, if you think about it, are based in some ways on a filter. And, it, and back to trashing the old media, the, the filters used to be David Broder and George Will and all those folks. Well, now the filters are, first they were uh, guys like Jerome and, and you know, the, the top bloggers. Now it's your friends. It's the people who are on your friends list. And now you're going to see a video because somebody emailed their entire Facebook friends list with a link to the, to the YouTube. And so now your filters are your peers. It's no longer information coming down on stone tablets from the Washington Post. It's people, it's coming into your inbox by people who are your peers. I hope there isn't any Republican running for office who isn't uh, counting on the fact that every public appearance is going to be uh, videoed at this point uh, and uh, you know, make some plan around that because it shouldn't be a, be a surprise the second time around. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if 2004 really probably was the, the election of the blogosphere, 2006 I think you could say, was the YouTube of elections. There are three great examples. Uh, George Allen in Virginia, uh, Harold Ford in, in Tennessee, the incident at the airport with Bob Corker where they got into an argument wasn't covered outside of Memphis until it got on YouTube. And then it was all over the nation, this confrontation. And then in Missouri, the Michael J. Fox advertisement, no one really saw it until it was put on YouTube. And then on YouTube, it made it to the Dredge Report, and it made it across the nation. If you have a question, please raise your hand or get the attention of one of the young ladies. We're going to ask two more questions here, and then we're going to go for a question to our uh, Edwards campus. So if they're ready to, if I can't see if this uh, woman in front here, and then secondly, in the back there. Keep your hand up if you'd like to ask a question, please. Hey, um, my name is Cami. I'm 27 year old, years old. I worked full time um, on a variety of political campaigns and causes from 2002 to 2005. Um, I'm currently only involved here in local grassroots level politics here in Lawrence. So I am definitely one of those political junkies that you talk about. Um, I can't help but make the observation that all of you are white. All of you are wealthy. And four out of five of you are men. And as someone who is not any of those things, um, aside from a woman, as one out of the five of them I are, I'm just wondering how, um, what you have to offer to someone like me and the majority of voters. Uh, I'm not wealthy, yeah. so I'm not wealthy. <laughs> take me out. Of, <laughs> yeah, take me yeah, off that, that list. Um, I, you know, I'm a I'm a quarter Ojibwe Indian. I'm half Irish. I think I think that gives me a good cultural heritage. That gives me a good perspective on the world. Um, and, and and then again, it doesn't. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm an individual, and what I think and what I feel is important is, um, is what's going to make it on my blog. And I think I speak for everybody in the, on the dais here that that's what blogging is about. It's about individuals. You know, we did a poll on uh, Mighty D recently, a demographic poll, and they turned out just like what you described. And that's, that's the readers that are on Mighty D. That's our community. But you can go to somewhere else in the blogosphere, and you will find a totally different community one that you resonate with, that's discussing the issues that you care about. It just so happens that, you know, that's, that's where, you know, how I was born. I can't do anything about it. But the beauty about the blogosphere is that no matter what your interests are, you know, and even now you have all kinds of, you know, sports blogs, a blogosphere for that, technology blogosphere, fashion blogosphere, gossip blogosphere, you can pretty much go on to anything and find a community around your interest in the blogosphere. You know, the, the, beautiful, the beautiful part about a blog, though, is that they can start one. It costs zero yeah. to start a blog. You know, you're, you're, you're so, if that's a problem, go do it. 
Yeah. I, you know, you don't need to buy a press. You don't need to own a newspaper. It costs zero to start a blog. Thank you. I want to remind you that um, we have a rule <laughs> of only one question at the Dole Institute, and you have to be speaking to a microphone, or nobody will be hearing you for your question. We have another question there in the back, and then we'll go to our KU Edwards campus for a question. Please, ma'am. Um, I'm also, like Eric, quite fascinated by Barack Obama sort of jumping the blogging shark and going straight to a social networking site. And I'm wondering, I'd like to hear more about what your perspectives are on that. You know, I, I'm really fascinated by, by, to some degree, his trying to, to jump the gun on everyone else on doing that. Um, it, it, you know, let me jump from o Obama and use a different candidate, Bobby Jindal in Louisiana, who's now running for governor. In 2003, uh, when he ran for governor, he got a wide attraction among, on college campuses. And I, someone told me the other day that uh, something like 50% of the students on LSU's campus who are on Facebook are all members of Bobby Jindal's uh, Facebook group. Uh, it, same with, with Obama. It's, it is a way to catch on with younger people. And I, I've got this running private joke with, with some friends that I'll, I'll share here, maybe to my embarrassment. But <laughs> between Facebook and, and MySpace, uh, what is the natural gravitation for candidates? Uh, I would say it's MySpace because generally those individuals are people on college campuses who are active, uh, who are in the community, uh, who, who have jobs. MySpace, I think, is still a, a larger unknown uh, with the political community. Of. I, I will say this, though, about Barack Obama. What was very interesting is in rushing to get out of the gate the other day, some of you may have read about this, it was all over the blogosphere, that someone had left text on his site uh, apparently it was unintentional, but as one of the groups you could join, it listed the gay and then a ro racial slur, uh, Society of America. And when people first started going on checking a site, that's what they saw as the sample group to join. Um, so the, again, there's a danger there, but I really am fascinated by this, trying to really reach out further than anyone else has. I, I applaud him for taking those steps. Um, I, I think it's going to be difficult to police. I mean, if you think blogs are difficult yeah. to monitor, yeah. <laughs> uh, wait till he tries to reconstruct something like MySpace. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the problem that, that he has in that in that particular adoption of technology with the, with the platform is that there's not a self-moderating community. I mean, if you look at the big blogs like Daily Coast Mighty D, it's the, built into the technology that the group can moderate it. So you give over some of that self-censorship over to the group to, to censor that type of thing. He doesn't have anything in place for that, so he's in a big trouble in terms of having to hire the resources to build that into the back end. You think John Edwards had a, had a problem of vetting with, with two of the bloggers he hired? Wait until people try to link Obama to something that someone said in his space. Well, it's already happened, actually. Yeah. The, uh, um, the, so, the, um, the secret, um, so, the secret service? service. Secret service. Sorry, thank you. The secret service um, found a death threat to Hillary Clinton oh, on Lord. Barack Obama's blog. And uh, released it to the public. Somebody on, you know, just went up and posted it. it happens all the time, over all over the internet. So, but yeah, it's, I mean, that's that's one of the dangers of embracing technology without some sort of like plan in terms of how are we going to moderate it. Now and, and opening yourself up to dirty tricks. Yeah. Hackers. Yeah. I mean that. Yeah, that could have been definitely been. Now we're going to try to go to our Edwards campus, the University of Kansas Edward campus, for a question. All right, well, we'll be back to here to Lawrence. Uh, we have in the back a question, and then second, do you have some, please raise your hand again if you have a question. Um, okay, given the fact that president, or political blogging removes many ambiguous, uh, vague stances and can be directly uh, addressed, directly and specifically addressed by other users online, could this mean a dismantling for some of the candidates who are unclear as to their future uh, Causes and in what way would this raise the expectations for future candidates? I didn't hear the first part. I'm yeah. sorry. I, <laughs> you were too quiet. I didn't hear the first part of your question. The microphone wasn't picking it up. Okay. Um, given the fact that um, political blogging removes many vague uh, and ambiguous stances and can be directly and specifically addressed by other uh, users on the internet, uh, could this mean a dismantling of some candidates who are unclear as to their cause and in what way would this raise expe expectations for future candidates? 
That's actually a good question. I think Mitt Romney is probably the best example right now of that happening, particularly in the pro-life debate. Um, in fact, at Red State several months ago, we did a podcast with Governor Romney uh, where he said that he had never really considered himself pro-choice or pro-life, that this wasn't a big issue to him until something happened with someone he knew and, and he became pro-life. And shortly thereafter, someone drudged up the 1994 video clip of he and, and uh, Ted Kennedy debating where he basically said that he was more pro-choice than Ted Kennedy would ever be. Uh, and it caused him some problems. And his team is very good at rapid response, but he has tried to toe the line on a lot of issues somewhat ambiguously from tax cuts to campaign finance reform to life issues. And, and bloggers are mercilessly attacking him. That's one thing I have to give John McCain and, and his campaign credit for is there are very few positions on which John McCain is ambiguous. And, and <laughs> he's, he's very happy about that. Some of these other candidates are trying to walk too fine a line. And, and they're seen in the blogosphere of the internet now that it's very, very hard to be very nuanced. I would also point to uh, George Allen's campaign in, in, in Virginia, the Senate campaign, and how it imploded. You had a case there where a candidate had hired a, a really experienced staff in the traditional method of handling your message, which was reaching out to the political reporters who are the traditional gatekeepers and making sure that they told the right story. Well, the blogosphere, and YouTube specifically with that, circumvented that and it opened up this huge vacuum of stories that were related to the racist issue for George Allen to flood, flood forth and all of a sudden that became the narrative. And he could no longer, he didn't have a grasp on the gatekeeper anymore and so his campaign imploded around that issue. We have a question here. Hi. Um, one of the criticisms that I've consistently heard about the blogosphere is that blogs cater to their base. If you're a liberal, you read left blogs. If you're a conservative, you read blogs on the right. And not only are there not very many moderate bloggers, but conservative and liberal bloggers don't talk to each other. There isn't a conversation across that ideological divide. Now, since many, if not most, of the voters in this country actually are moderates, I'd like you to talk a little bit about um, how blogs can communicate with those people and whether or not that's an audience that's being missed by blogs. There are blogs out there in, 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 the, in the, you know, the center. There's just not a lot of people. I don't know. I do think we talk. I don't, I don't know. Maybe you don't say we don't talk with each other, but we do fight with each other. <laughs> yeah. I, I, think that, I think that there's a slight, somewhat blaming the victim there in, in the sense that moderates and independents, while they have a, a huge amount of control in the in the decision-making process aren't nearly as engaged as people yeah. on the extremes. And so that, you know, they make their decision, in, not to use the cliche, in the last two weeks of the campaign. Well, they're obviously not spending their time researching issues, debating, fighting, getting together and, and chatting. So um, I don't think it's that blogs don't cater to moderates or independents. I think it's that moderates and independents aren't paying as much attention this far out like we all are. I mean, we're all going to go back and log on to our computers in our hotel rooms and, and check our email and check our blogs. And, and the bottom line is people who, who don't follow this like we do um, aren't going to do those kinds of things ever. I have some well-meaning friends who set out to create blogs to cater to the, to the middle to, to have conversations between the left and the right. Uh, without fail, all of them descended into either being very partisan left or very partisan right. The, the, the middle couldn't sustain it. There's, there's to some degree not the market there. I, I think it was uh, it, Barney Frank, it, it was him who, who said that either be to the left or be to the right because the middle lacks no passion. And whether he's, he's right or not overall, I think on the blogosphere, to some degree, that's very true. Yes. I have a couple of questions quickly. Um, ask you to uh, make some predictions. Uh, do you believe that the blog and the, these new media types will make the stump speeches of the candidates antiquated and unnecessary? And the second quick question is, do you think that a blog will ruin a campaign this year for, or uh, next year for the presidential campaign? What was the predictions you wanted? Um. <laughs> Stump speeches, and are we going to bring anybody down? Are we going to ruin anybody? Now, do you mean on our own side or on the other <laughs> side? <laughs> I'd say yes to both, probably. They, they have to go out and 
meet people face to face and in person. There's, there will always be stump speeches. Um, hopefully we can help them be more interesting stump speeches, a little bit more relevant to what people want to hear. If they're learning what blogs can do for them, coming out, talking to us, refining their message, seeing how it works, then maybe we could make their, their stump speech better. Um, we're not going to ruin anybody that isn't setting themselves up to be ruined. So that's what I have to say <laughs> on that one. A reminder, please, if you're asking a question, wait until you have the microphone. Thank you, sir. Please. Uh, relating to what you said earlier about moderate people basically being left out and the impression that I get that you really don't care, <laughs> how can you say that uh, the blogosphere is improving and engaging and expanding the concept of democracy if all you're doing is talking to, what do you say, 11% or just to each other and the moderates aren't engaged? The blog I write at, Daily Coast, gets upwards of a million hits a week. Um, I know not all of those people reading our blog are partisan Democrats. I know a lot of people reading the blogs are Republicans. Um, they're not necessarily participating. We do have a few pet Republicans that, that we keep around to argue with. Uh, but the vast majority of people reading the blogs aren't actually active in commenting in them. So we don't honestly know the makeup, the demographic of who's reading. But, but I know we wouldn't have that many readers if it wasn't a full spectrum politically. Here's the thing, though. They might not be, the moderates might not be in the political blogosphere. But I guarantee you they're in some other blogosphere. They might be over in the sports or in the entertainment or somewhere else. It's the job of politicians and campaigns not to look at the blogosphere as just a political blogosphere, but to realize that the people are in these other areas as well. You know, one of the first things I did with um, Mark Warner's campaign was bring somebody on to do outreach into, the, into, all the, into all the tech blogs and that whole blogosphere because he had a strong background in that area. And I, I'm sure you can go and look in, in some of the conservative candidates that realize there's, there's evangelical blog, blogosphere out there to do outreach into. You know, it's, I think we've probably all seen this before. While, while moderates may not be engaged in the conversation, I agree with Joan, they're, they're probably reading. But the media reads blogs. And as much as we've been up here to some degree bashing the, the, the media and, and how they portray blogs and look at blogs, they read us and more and more getting stories off of blogs on the left and the right and shaping their opinions and their views. So while we may not be directly interacting with a moderate, although I think we probably are, just not actively, that they are reading the newspapers and watching the news and seeing stories that we have helped form to some degree based on all of our ideas put out there. We have a question over here. Um, this is sort of a related question. It's directed, uh, I guess any of you can answer it. I was struck by something Mr. Erickson said uh, when you said that still a relatively low number of people are reading blogs, but most of them are opinion leaders. And it reminded me of a famous rock music observation that only a thousand people bought the first album by the Velvet Underground, but every one of them started bands. And do you think that, my question is, is there a danger that it eventually sort of becomes an echo chamber of opinion leaders? And if we are overstating the influence of blogs, and if the bloggers are themselves overstating that influence. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, you know, I, I think there is. Uh, bloggers take themselves very seriously. I think we all do. Um, we all joke about it as well. But there are some out there who, if you, I, Scott and I are lawyers by training. There are a lot of lawyers who get upset by lawyer jokes. I personally like them. I'm sure there are plenty of bloggers out there who would get upset by a blogger joke as well. But, you know, the Pew number was at 11%. I believe that was last year's survey. But where it can be overstated is that while it may only be 11% of the people who are, are reading blogs nationally, these are people in their community who the same survey shows are the people others go to to help them make up their mind. So I don't think in that sense you'll get an echo chamber because these are the people other people rely on. The the people who help shape opinions in their community with their neighbors, with their family. Uh, but yeah, there, there is definitely a danger because the medium is so new. Some people think it's the latest, greatest thing, and, and it's, it's just a tool. It's, it's not going to change the world by itself. We have a question in the back. I was just wondering if you all thought that um, blogs would benefit one political party more than the other, whether it give Republicans maybe a chance to defend themselves more on the position of the war in Iraq or Democrats 
you know, more of an opportunity to bash that. To date, I think that it has favored the Democratic Party more. And I would attribute that to it being more of a vehicle for an outsider or an insurgency voice to influence the debate. And for most of this decade, until the last midterm elections, the Republicans had, they had been the ascended party. They were in power. They had no need really to change the way the campaigns are waged, waged or the way they interact with people. I do think though, and you guys can speak to this though, with the, the 08 race with the Republican side, I've seen a, a, a lot more activity in terms of engagement with the establishment and the blogosphere on the Republican side. Well, I, I was going to say that I think that the Democratic Party, and not the Democratic Party proper, but the activist base, got very, very good at using the internet as a communications tool and an activism tool because they had to. It was sort of Darwin at work. Republicans were winning elections from 2000 to 2006 because they had better TV commercials and they had better radio commercials and they had better direct mail programs and all the rest of it. And the Democratic consultants were not competing well with them. So there's this huge swath of activists who've who started this conversation and and now all of a sudden they're really making a difference and and I think Scott hit on this very very early in this discussion that there are some elements of the conservative side of the blogosphere who don't view themselves as part of a mu movement that they're they're smart people and they have very strong opinions and they're willing to partake in some kind of some level of activism at times but they don't consider themselves part of a movement the way I think most of the Daily Coast readers do but don't you think that's going to change? I mean, uh, especially if you lose the presidency in 08. Well, I think we're going to try to change it. But it, you know, there, I think there's a psychological distinction between people who are left of center and people who are right of center. People who are right of center, every, every one of us thinks we're smarter than all, everybody else. And You mean we're not? Yeah, and, so, <laughs> and so the natural thing for each one of us to do, instead of join somebody else's blog, and join that conversation is to just start my own. And I'm just going to start my own. I'm going to show everybody that I'm smarter than, than, than the rest of them because my insights are so much better than everybody else's. And, so, and before long, those insights end up drying up, and you've got a lot of sort of dead links laying out there on blogger.com. Well, it, it, I mean, the same thing. The, the danger of being conservative is you're slow to progress. I, I mean, the, the progressive blogosphere progressed very quickly in the blogosphere. The, the conservatives, it, it's very interesting being in a place like Red State where it, there's been a sea change in Congress but before the 06 election, trying to reach out to leadership, in, in the Republican leadership in Congress, to Republicans in general in Congress, was very, very difficult. The bloggers were the, these weird troublemakers on the internet. Stay away from them. Um, and now after the election, that they're, they're beating down your door wanting access, and you're, you're beating them away with a stick. Uh, because, again, they're, they're conservative. They're slow to change. That They've been defeated, but particularly on the right, I, I, the Republican side, they haven't gotten it yet to a large degree. So while yeah, I used this example earlier, I was giving a talk on Capitol Hill a while back and had one slide in the presentation that said blogs are unique, press releases don't work. And within 48 hours, people were sending me press releases asking me to post them online. It, it, it's very slow to get. The, uh, I, let me just add one point. And the, 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 maybe the shrewdest political observer in the country right now, I think, is M Michael Barone, who writes for, for the old media for uh, US News and appears on uh, new media, Fox News, cable television as a political commentator. And he's made the observation over the years that the, uh, the blogosphere has really evolved down two paths on the left side that I think Joan and Jerome represent well. There's this kind of movement aspect of supporting uh, particular uh, candidates and acting as a vehicle um, for them and, and to influence campaigns in a particular direction. On the right side, and the, the, the impetus uh, among so many of us who have acted independently and devoted our, or, you know, our time and effort to this, um, separate and apart from our day jobs, has been a kind of critique of the mainstream media, which in our view has been in the grips of a kind of elite liberal uh, mentality that's on display in the broadcast networks and the New York Times and the Washington Post and the folks who set the uh, the agenda for news coverage in the national media that's driven a lot of us I think that uh, serving at, as uh, 
uh, some kind of a force to take them down as a gatekeeper on balance helps the conservative side uh, and the Republican Party, but not in the direct, not in the same kind of way that Joan and Jerome have. Uh, Isn't it in some ways, though, that because you're, you're fitting into the larger narrative that much of the, you know, the Republican energy has went towards? I mean, the talk radio expansion, a lot of that was towards you know, taking down that, that and media. I, that's ab absolutely right. I think the internet uh, on the right side uh, is a, has a kind of synergy with talk radio and with, uh, with Fox News on, on the cable news networks uh, that's been additive, but uh, it's so much more powerful because it's so much more distributed. Uh, um, but it, it has added, I think, something that, that uh, together really has made the, the, uh, the medium work on the right side in a different way. Thank you. We have another question over here. Yeah, I'm relaying a question from a young lady at Blue Valley North High School, and she would like to know, what is the impact of Facebook and MySpace on young voters? Well, I did a, an outreach to um, Facebook voters in Iowa, New Hampshire, and, and South Carolina early on when I was working with Warner, and the, you know, we, we brought in quite a few that we were able to reach out to into the campaign quickly. Young people in the last two generations, by young people I mean up to the age of 28, 18 to 28, the voters, has increased as a percentage any time greater than 1972 since when they first started voting. So they're very active. And, I, and somebody asked a question earlier about Barack Obama and you know what that all means. Well, if he gets the activists in that, in that younger generation engaged this earlier through Facebook, and he's got over a quarter million now signed up, I think we can count on them voting for them. It's, it's a matter of whether or not he can take it to that next level, and, and some degree he has because he's validated it. You know, when Howard Dean started Meetup in January of 2003, the first thing he did before, when there was only about 400 people signed up was that he sent out an email to all of those people saying, it's great that you signed up, I'm, I'm glad you're doing it, and make sure you tell somebody else about it too. That validation spurred it on even more, and you saw a similar thing with Barack Obama when he did a rally that was organized by people that began on Facebook with him. Uh, Joan, I think you mentioned money early on and advertising possibly also. And I was wondering, in the near future, if you think the blogosphere will allow a less well-financed candidate to compete? I've been hearing the number 100 million, I think, bannered around the last few days that a candidate already needs 100 million to be viable at this time and so early in the election cycle? Will blogosphere help reduce some of that in the near future? I doubt in the near future. I mean, we're still going to be run by television. Um, as video technology, excuse me, improves and as its reach improves, I think we'll see more emphasis on free media, on what the campaigns can produce themselves and put out over the internet. Um, but right now, they're still going to need that $100 million for OH. They're still going to need to get into TV. They're still going to need to do direct mail. That's not going away. Not my, quickly. My view is that campaigns are only going to become more expensive because what we're seeing is a fragmentation of the media. It's no longer that you can just count on running your broadcast ads and reaching everybody. You now have so many different channels, so many different niches of media to do your outreach in. Any candidate that's relying upon television alone is losing a lot of the people that they're not reaching. To put, you have to put resources and energy into reaching all those different channels. It's going to cost even more. It, it will cost more. And the reason is because when you look at political communication, nothing replaces anything else. They layer on top of each other. So when television came along, it didn't do away with radio advertising. It me meant you had to do both. And when radio came along, it didn't do away with billboards and yard signs. It meant that you had to do those and you had to advertise on radio. And Well, now you have to advertise and raise money and spend a lot of time um, working the Internet. And it's just layered on top of everything else, and it's actually driving up the cost of elections. I just wanted to say that I'm not really a big fan of politicians because they always kind of tiptoe around the issues. And do you feel that like when they respond to blogs, they're more direct on their stances, or are they still kind of just say what people want to hear to get votes? They tried that and realized it wasn't working. Um, it, it's it, at least from my perspective, there, there are a number of them who 
they won't engage the blogosphere because they can't tiptoe. Uh, I think most of the ones, uh, I, I would say most of the ones on the left and the right who really engage in the blogosphere are willing not to tiptoe as best they can and the others stay out of the water to their detriment. I think you saw a perfect example of that when Senator John Kerry guest posted at the Daily Coast. Uh, during most of the 2004 campaign, he tried to tiptoe around one big particular issue and that was Iraq. And yet when he guest posted on the Daily Coast, he was very forthright with the community there. And I think that the general consensus is that the community is very appreciative of his frankness and his candidness. And, 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 frank, and frankly, I think the community would have been even more energized if he'd said those kinds of things on the campaign trail. Um, so yeah, I think that it, anybody that's gonna try to delve into that space has gotta be totally frank and, and the spin will not work. Over here, please. Hi, I've just been listening this whole time and I'm hearing about this push-pull with the traditional media. I know you've touched on that there's more just layers now instead of, you know, instead of TV there's radio and then now blogging. And I know that you've touched on, um, you know, some, some precautionary and some warnings and things like that. But I'm just wondering from each of you, do you really, where do you really see blogging going? I know we talked about maybe not right now, but an evolution later. Do you really see blogging kind of influencing the media even more and sort of replacing traditional media or just becoming part of a fighting for more of that sort of percentage of the pie of where people are getting their information from. I'm just wondering if any, if any of you up there, what, what your sort of like hopes and goals for blogging, do you eventually see it completely replacing traditional media or just kind of where, or do you see it as I, just I sort of complementary? I, I think that what's going to happen is there are going to be a number of large blogs that are going to continue to be successful and I think as more and more old media venues understand that they're losing circulation, they're losing viewers, they're gonna try to buy, um, they're gonna walk in and they're making, gonna make an offer to Scott Johnson, and they're gonna make an offer to Marcos Molitsas, and they're gonna say, we wanna buy this blog, and we want to claim it as one of our properties. And that's gonna ruin blogging. <laughs> Well, I come from a, coming from the perspective of seeing it much more movement-oriented in politics rather than media. I see blogging going down to the more local level. One of the things that we've been pushing this year on the progressive side is the development of the local blogosphere, more state-based blogs. And so we've, we've, we now have, I think, in the 40s-something state blog communities that are happening. And so you know that, that at that level, then you begin to really begin, begin to impact you know, we talk about net roots action translating into grassroots action. So you begin to impact local politics, and if we can integrate that within the blogosphere, then it becomes very powerful. I, I'm going to thread jack your question to some degree to, to answer it, but going back to this gentleman's question on the 11% issue, I should have thought of this earlier, completely stealing someone else's material, but it's valid for this point. Uh, there, for 100% of the people in, in the nation, only 70% are actually registered to vote. And of that 70%, only 50% really vote. And of that 50%, 19 will go Democrat all the time. 18 will go Republican all the time. Three will go single issue abortion, guns, environment all the time. That really leaves about 10, 11% left. There's your 10, 11% who read the blogosphere. They are more likely than not to write letters to their members of Congress. They are more likely than not to send money to candidates. They are more likely than not to run for office than anyone else. Uh, so as the blogosphere grows, there's going to be a recognition, I think, in the media uh, and the public at large that to be informed, to be current, to, to be ahead of the curve, uh, going to the blogs is, is where they need to be, particularly on the local level. You're really starting to see more and more impressively local communities. In fact, in Georgia, where I'm from, uh, there's a, a local community up north of Atlanta that was having community watch problems. So they set up a community watch, a neighborhood watch blog, and people will get on there at 3 o'clock in the morning and blog about the strange car that went through the neighborhood. It, it it's, it's, may not be political, but I mean, this is growing in, in shapes and fashions, and people who want to be ahead of the curve are going there. I think we have time for one or two very quick questions. Please, over here. Yeah, I was just curious. Uh, one factor with the presidential uh, elections that's uh, unique is the, de is the dynamic of electoral votes. And I know that in the last couple of elections, you know, if you lived in Florida or Ohio, you probably had a presidential candidate stop by your door. But if you live in a state like Kansas, you had a hard enough time having them wave as they went by on a train. 
Do you see these new technologies being a tool in which states like Kansas are ones that haven't really had their, um, their topics voiced in the national um, discussion, uh, a technology that we can use to, to have our opinions heard more uh, and ignored less, I guess? <laughs> like Georgia we're just being used they just ignore us all you're red we don't need you we've got you yeah it's more hey, I'm from Idaho it's <laughs> more a factor of the Democratic Party being weak in Kansas for so long and there has been a recent resurgence of that and we'll turn it around so hopefully hopefully it is competitive next cycle than it is of necessarily not having you know the technology in a certain sense though the you know with Howard Dean the, the 50 state movement came out of the Dean campaign which came out of the, the meetup organizing. And it, meetups didn't just happen in the Democratic blue states, they happened all over the country. And that's what really came out, that ca what, where the 50 state movement came out of was that meetup organizing that happened on Dean's campaign across the nation. Well, we'll have to leave it on that note, and we want to thank you very much for coming tonight. I've got lots of new, new things to put in my syllabus and my <laughs> lectures, for, and we hope that uh, three years from now you can come back and, and look at these uh, predictions and, and discussions, and maybe we'll be using a new term, but I think we all agree that the conversation that's going on about electing the president and also changing our politics in our country is going to continue, and there's no end in sight for these new interactive media technologies. Thank you for coming to the Dole Institute.